So Rick, let's first start with, um, you know, you, you, you've been a big fan of the, the Western Canadian Sedimentary Basin, which is a, a Canadian oil patch. And looking at the leadership of the Canadian country, I think they're more focused on, you know, marijuana and making it legal than actually making the business of infrastructure happen. Um, we're at, you know, 30 year highs for the differentials, meaning the discount the Canadian companies are selling their oil versus the Americans. Uh, you, you gotta love Warren Buffett's foresight. You know, he's shipping, you know, Burlington North San, uh, is shipping record amounts of oil via rail, which is actually the worst way to do it. Where's Rick Rule's uh, money in the Canadian sedimentary basin, or are you just like, hey, this is risk off? No, I'm actually gonna creep back in the basin. Um, I can't help myself. I made a lot of money in Calgary uh, in the early 90s, <clears throat> and then the Canadians made so much money that there wasn't any room for me in Calgary anymore. You know, if a deal got out of Calgary, you knew you were getting stiffed because there was too much money there. Now the joke is the only thing Calgary can make a deposit on Mercedes is a seagull. Uh, so there's room to come back. Uh, the political thing that you talk about is risky. Uh, in fact, uh, Canadians, like Americans, should be forbidden from voting. Um, the only thing wrong with that basin is there's no access and digress, no transportation access and digress, as you wisely pointed out. Should the Canadians follow through with the plans for the Northern Spur LNG facility at Kitimat, <clears throat> that'll begin to change the game up there. But here's a question. I'm not holding my breath for that, of course. Here, I'm 65. It you. might occur in your life. The other pipeline got approved, and yet the, F F the financial investment decision was approved, and yet the NGOs came in, and, yep. and then they challenged it municipally, provincially, federally, and they won, and they delayed. So do you not see that happening with the LNG, or is it a different story for LNG? I think, it's, I think there's, there's a huge chance that that occurs. Um, <clears throat> some of the First Nations now are pushing back pretty aggressively, <clears throat> on the NGOs, um, our mutual friend Jerry Asp told the politicians in northern British Columbia that if they thought that they were sending his members back on the trap line, uh, you know, the prior industry was muskrats, that that wasn't going to occur. Uh, it's going to be a process. <clears throat> but I think what you need to remember about the Western Sedimentary Basin is there's, there's just superb geology there. And there's a superb coterie of technical people in Calgary and Red Deer and Edmonton. And the industry has absolutely no friends. And I've tried to discipline myself to be a friend when high quality people didn't have any. Um, Nick, you don't really focus too much on the Canadian sedimentary basin, do you? No, not at all. In fact, I would say risk off no money in it. Now, with almost a million barrels of pipe being completed by next year in the U.S., how do you see the price of oil for WTI over the next 12 months? You know, I think we've had a good run up into seventy, eighty dollars a barrel. It's pulled back a bit now. I think that what you risk when oil prices start to get at or higher than they are now is recession, and we're due for one in the U.S. anyway. And so, I don't think we're going to get to back over a hundred dollars a barrel like some people are calling for. I've seen a four hundred dollar number lately this week in an article, and I just don't see Was that it. from Sprott. I think I might have saw that. <laughs> No, only the newsletter marketers do shit like that. <laughs> and it just doesn't respond to geopolitical tensions the way it used to, right? I mean, we've had things going on with uh, the Saudi journalist in the past two weeks and Turkey in the months prior before that and the ongoing crisis in Syria. And these things in 2000 and 2005 would have sent oil to $100, $150 a barrel. And it just doesn't respond like it does anymore. So, you know, pipeline or not, the, the U.S. is now awash in oil and natural gas. And I think we level off. The last time the three of us were on stage, I don't know if you guys remember, was the 2000, 2014 uh, New Orleans conference with our buddy Brian London, and I guess I was the, uh, the negative nanny on the group, and Rick, you and I debated how oil could go a lot oil a lower because of fracking, and I was a big believer that, hey, costs are going to go lower, you and I, and you thought I was smoking what the Canadians produce which I don't. Uh, have you changed your opinion now on that fracking factor and how costs can go a lot lower? They're doing uh, an amazing job driving <clears throat> costs lower. I would point out to you that the um, U.S. unconventional industry in 10 years has generated no free cash. Uh, it's so capital intensive that while they've doubled production, they haven't doubled free cash. I would say that the real, the real technological miracle 
<clears throat> behind fracking is the technology of low interest rates. Uh, as long as they keep the interest rate low, if they can keep the U.S. 10-year at 3, which means that they're going to keep, you know, prime plus 2 or whatever that number is, at sort of 5 or 5.5, uh, then the fracking industry is in good shape. But remember, it's so capital intensive. And the balance sheets of the independent producers in the United States are not things of beauty. Uh, that, that, would be, that would be my caution. I am absolutely impressed with the implementation technologies, not just the broad technologies that are used, but how good the industry has been to adapting them to local circumstances and situations. That's absolutely amazing. And I yeah, wish we could do that in the mining business. Well, it's good. the mining business is 20 years behind the oil patch. Now, Nick, at that time, uh, you were quite bullish on coal. Where are you today on, let's start with thermal coal, then we'll go to met coal. I knew you were going to talk about met coal. You love met coal way too much. Um, no, look, I, so does tech, and they're making nothing but money. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I'm, I'm really not involved uh, in coal investments uh, either, and I think that coal stays where it is. I mean, it, it's base load, it's it's dirty, it's quite capital intensive to to clean it up, and there's really no high quality replacements we're starting to build natural gas because we have we have so much natural gas in the united states but i mean coal from an international standpoint is it's dirty rick coal consumption whether you like it or not is increasing on a global basis both met and thermal coal we're not in the thermal coal business at sprott because we haven't had the ability to be in it with somebody that was in the lowest cost quartile we are in the met coal business that was a really bad business three years ago. I mean, it's, it's, <clears throat> it's heartbreaking to see your train roll into Baltimore and know that you're $200,000 upside down on that train. But the last one of our trains that came into Baltimore, we were up $2 million. And that's a much better circumstance. So I like the coal business. <clears throat> now let's go to natural gas, which, you know, if you look at the rigs on the natural gas, it's, it, you know, we're at the low end, but yet we're making massive discoveries. And let's just focus on North America here now for natural gas. Uh, Rick, when you and I were on stage 12, 13 years ago, it was a six to one ratio. Now it's a completely different story. In Canada, the ACO price the other day was 10 cents per MCF. In, in, in the Henry Hub was $3.20. Uh, where do you see natural gas prices moving forward? Uh, next two years, there's just so much byproduct gas in Canada from condensate, and because they can't move it out, <clears throat> and the states buy product gas. So the next couple of years, pretty cheap, um, because the gas is viewed by many producers as being free. It's, it's funny that you say 10 cents. The first gas I ever sold in Canada as an investor was in 1972, and that was at 12 cents at MCF. It's amazing how you work. 45 years in industry and you end up at the same selling point without the denominator, without the, <laughs> the purchasing power of what you're getting paid staying the same. So that says something. I mean, if you're a dry gas producer in Alberta, you're, screwed. you're just stuffed. Nick, what, do you have a different opinion on that gas? No, I don't think it, it works anymore. It used to be for two decades, you could buy natural gas in October and sell it in February when it got cold in Chicago. And that just doesn't happen anymore. It's, it doesn't work. So let's talk about the internationals now. Rick, you like taking some of these big punts. Um, what is your favorite international oil speculation? Um, boy, I probably don't know it yet. Um, about once a year. You're waiting for my next monthly letter, is that oh. why? <laughs> Off offshore Croatia is not something <laughs> I've ever ventured into for some reason. Nor reasons. would I, you know about my real estate project there. <laughs> No, we, um, you know, occasionally, <clears throat> we at Sprott and I personally uh, am doing more in the oil and gas business privately than we are publicly. Uh, what we've found is that the cost of capital in public markets is higher than the cost of capital in private markets. So I would suspect that we'll see something offshore Africa or offshore Southeast Asia that we'll participate in as an, in an exploration venture privately. Um, when I look at the opportunities in front of us, <clears throat> and I look at the fact that you and I participated eight years ago now in a stranded billion barrel discovery in northern Kenya, 
Um, <clears throat> that was nine, nine years ago. Okay. Time flies when you're having fun. Uh, and you can buy that stranded, that stranded billion barrels uh, relatively inexpensively and take some risk on Kenyan politics. And we got a warrant out of Lucas yeah. Lundy. Oh. <laughs> that was lovely. It's, it's, see how easy it is for Marin to bring a smile to my face? He gives, gives me a good memory and then reminds me that I had a warrant too. Yeah, that was wonderful. <laughs> you can keep doing that if you'd like, Marin. Nick, what's your favorite uh, international oil speculation? I don't think I have one either. I, I, I think the, the world is... is, is you know, moving away from from that kind of thing. We just talked about how oil prices, I think, are going to stay level. And so I've seen a couple of deals. People are starting to get excited about oil, but it just it doesn't excite me right now for, for any reason. And, and I know this panel is titled, How Has the Energy Trade Changed? And we're going to talk about that, I think. But you've got every major car manufacturer in the world going electric. And so I just simply have not paid any attention to, to oil and gas. So when you, when you look at the, the massive shift, Daimler Chrysler came out today and said, we have not ruled out not working with Elon Musk. So when you see this massive shift, but then at the same time, you see these massive investments like Maersk made into our mutual friend in Africa Oil buying you know 25% of it. Are they hedging themselves, Nick? Or do you see that the automakers are just saying, hey, we're going electric and that's it? From what I've seen, they say we're going electric and that's it. I'm not sure the consumer is entirely ready for it. I mean, I drive a Ford F-150, and I'm not sure there's a quality electric F-150 that can they can haul around trailers and boats and things like that that's all electric. And so, I mean, the, the European manufacturers are committed. You know, Volvo and Volkswagen and, and, and even Porsche has come out with now an, an electric sports car that they say charges faster than Teslas and things like that. And so... I mean, they're going to continue producing conventional cars, to be sure, but the sea change is here. And whether or not you think Tesla is a scam, which, which it may be, it certainly is not making money and, and hitting the milestones that it says it's going to. The last quarter was pretty good, though. Well, it's one quarter. He, but, but he he he, he overpromises and underdelivers all the time, though. We were supposed to have a third. Sounds like a mining promoter to me. <laughs> But you do have to credit him with initiating the sea change, no matter what you think uh, about But in all fairness, Tesla. what Elon Musk did is pretty amazing exactly. and fascinating. I, I'd love to have see a mining guy do what he's done and really disrupt an industry. Um, I made a comment about the U.S. pipeline increase of over a million barrels next year in infrastructure. The U.S. have been year over year the largest increase in international market share over the last five years, and the Saudis have been second, and you see the massive decrease of Iraq and other parts of OPEC. Um, what does that do to the petrodollar, Rick? I don't know. I honestly don't know. The <clears throat> I, I found that the larger the subject, <clears throat> the, the less most people's ability to comprehend it is. Um, and so I honestly don't know. What about you, Nick? As a great writer, what's your narrative on that? Dennis Garman once stood on stage in New Orleans, and he's the greatest contrarian indicator that we know, right? And he's he once, but he made a, he made a good point, and it's always stuck in my head. It was one of the first years I attended, and he said, "There's one reason that the U.S. will will remain petrodollar dominant in the in the world's reserve currency." And then he said two words: aircraft carriers. And so, you know, Russia and China are trying to do their thing. Uh, Russia has been has been selling U.S. Treasuries. I I don't I don't see it happening without some major global confrontation but when you look at you know uh america was the largest importer of saudi oil now they're a competitor and you see china is now the largest importer of oil there must be some major dynamics changing on on that perspective where the saudis and russians now have a common enemy in the u.s yes well, look, we'll, we'll see. On an oil basis, I mean. I, I can give you an anecdote about that. We have, <clears throat> it's brought a very large Asian parastatal client, um, our largest client. <clears throat> I was visiting with them about the fact that they had so many U.S. treasuries in their portfolio. <clears throat> and as an American, I thanked them. I said, you know, I think it's wonderful that um, you guys send us cars and computers and all this cool stuff, and we send you back pieces of papers with dreams painted on them. I mean, I, from my point of view, that's a really cool trade. Um, but I'm curious, from your point of view in the portfolio, um, what you see in the U.S. Treasury that an American doesn't. <clears throat> I see it almost as a lie. 
And my Asian counterpart looked at me and smiled. He says, Mr. Rule, ultimately what you say is true, but yours is a very deep and liquid lie, unlike all the other lies that are told to us. And so <clears throat> I, thought th I thought that was interesting. And I said, do you trust us? And he said, not at all, but we trust you more than we trust each other. And I think part of the strength of the dollar has to do with the fact that we don't have an opaque market. We have a liquid market. Uh, and I think right now the world doesn't have any choice but to have us as the reserve currency. Because although they don't trust us, they meaning the Chinese, the Japanese, the Russians, they trust us more than they trust each other. That's a very good point, and it's almost the key there is liquidity. If you look at the silver coin, the American Eagle, it's only three ninths silver. The Canadian Maple Leaf silver coin is four ninths silver, and yet the three ninths silver, which has less silver in it, trades at a premium to the Canadian Maple Leaf. And you know, if you want to lose a billion dollars in U.S. Treasuries, that takes about a second of responsible trading. I mean, a second for a billion dollar print. It's liquid unlike anything else on the planet. Okay, so now let's shift over to, we see that you know the electric vehicles are real, they are growing, and especially when the Chinese are mandating. And one thing that we've seen with the Chinese government, when, when they mandate something, it's going to happen, or else the president of the company may disappear. Um, I, th I think that's wrong. <clears throat> I honestly do. But the, the Chinese are showing that The it Chinese is true. mandated nine years ago that diesel in China would be to California standards with regards to sulfur emissions. I mean, if the Chinese actually decide to do something, they do it. But very often it's brought, we've seen broad mandates from the top that changed in implementation because there are powerful forces below the top that continue to lobby. So I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not disputing your point at all that the Chinese will move towards more electric vehicles. I'm saying that in my own experience, the message from the top often gets altered by the time it gets lower because there are big, big, big interests in China. You're, you're also themselves. too much experience with the American politicians where you're, 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 oh, you're used to being let down. But the apocalypse, any, yeah. the, the apocalypse in China is getting to the point over the last nine years that you know, the people will revolt if there's not a change. So the data is showing that the biggest growth year over year and the largest uh, market for electric vehicles is China, not California, not the US, not Europe, it's China. So let's go with this narrative that it's going to continue when you get the energy metals. Now I want to talk about some of the energy metals. Nick, what is your favorite energy metal? Uh, at the time, it's, it's lithium. I mean, we had this Morgan Stanley report out earlier this year that was poo-pooing lithium in a big way, and I think it, it caused a, a sell-off across the sector where, where quality assets were thrown out. We've seen Chinese buyers come in in a big way. One of my biggest wins was Lithium X. It was acquired, I, th I believe, last year by, by a Chinese firm. Um, and so I think it's depressed right now still from that Morgan Stanley report, and I think there are some quite good assets, uh, especially in Argentina. We've now moved out of Nevada in the Clayton Valley thing for, for lithium. Um, but it, it's going to come back. It, it, it almost has to as, as a main component of the batteries for these cars. Rick, you've been talking about lithium from a pharmaceutical standpoint for 15 years. What's your opinion on the lithium market? Yeah, I mean, you know, lithium investors recently would be well advised to go up to Calistoga and lay in some. Um, <clears throat> I have a different point of view than my friend Nick with regards to lithium. I've grown up in industries, oil and gas and geothermal, where lithium was a cost. And the idea that the world is short of it has always been interesting to me. I think what happened in lithium is that we were short productive capacity. We were short the ability to process lithium resources at a time when lithium demand grew very quickly. Uh, <clears throat> SQM, the second largest lithium producer in the world, said in their most recent annual report that at current production rates, they're down to 90 years of reserves. And <clears throat> I've observed a situation where the companies looking for lithium that have none describe, their, describe the shortage. But the producers say what is missing is current productive capacity, depending on the chemical type of lithium. My own my own favorite battery metals are <clears throat> the battery metals in drag, um, nickel and copper that have other uses, or if the audience has the stomach for political risk, which as you know I do, cobalt. Okay, so let's go with that cobalt. Uh, what are some safe ways you, you can no play such, it through okay. Glencore, which is the world's largest probably uh, independent producer of cobalt? Glencore exposes you to a different set of risks. There are some probably real questions about how they came about acquiring their assets. 
and those questions are in the process of being answered by international court, the safest way, and the audience is just going to start laughing, and you're going to laugh even harder, uh, <clears throat> I think, the safest way is Norilsk. Um, you have to be willing to accept the opacity of Russian capital markets. And an oligarch battle. And an oligarch battle, Pays yeah. the best dividend, 9% dividend. Mm -hmm. They've invested $9 billion in reclamation and, and cleaning up that area. Mm -hmm. um, it's a jewel box. It's, an it's funny what the gulag box. can create, eh? Mm -hmm. uh, Nick, what about if they create new chemistries in these batteries? Um, cobalt. Vanadium. What's your outlook on those? Well, I think I'm I'm with Rick on the on the cobalt trade. I think that you're going to start seeing life cycle analysis come into play on on these cars and and also computers and, and data centers for that matter, and especially self driving cars because of all the data they consume. Um, I, I've now lost my train of thought. Oh, so back to cobalt. Boy, does Vancouver need some self driving cars? Yeah, and so. You can't have your cobalt coming from the from the DRC when you're trying to drive a, a clean car, right? And so we're going to have to start looking for, for new places. There's been a consolidation of the, the cobalt camp in Ontario. There's been some, some decent companies put together uh, in Idaho, and I've seen some, some interesting exploration stories. But there's... There's really been no love for them as of late. I've seen some great press releases, some 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 decent drill results, some some good partnerships, and the market hasn't really responded. Similar to the lithium trade. Do you know Glencore is going to spill more cobalt than Idaho is ever going to produce? And the camp in cobalt, I mean, it's all wonderful, but they don't have any cobalt. It's a silver camp. I mean, what people want is or low grade nickel projects. Yeah, what people want is you know politically correct salamander friendly cobalt. And what that means is that they want the tooth fairy. Uh, if you want cobalt and you want economic cobalt, if you want <clears throat> best quarter capital efficiency, best quarter cash costs, your choices are very, very, very simply Katanga or Russia. That's all it is. There's Australian cobalt. There's mountains of cobalt in Australia, but it occurs in the same concentration that it does in San Francisco Bay. You know, it's very, very, very low-grade cobalt. There's some high-grade cobalt in Idaho, enough to build maybe seven, eight, nine cars. Um. <laughs> so there's a free research report on our website, Katusa Research, where we talked about a year and a half ago about watch out for the coming scams and hustles where these really crappy low-grade nickel projects with some byproduct of nickel, and then they're going to be reproduced. And boy, was I, did I underestimate the ingenuity or... You know, you were up against a really good promoter in that scheme. In, the, in know, that scheme, and, and I couldn't believe how much uh, these five percent of the economic value of the uh, cobalt ninety-five was nickel, and it would never work at the nickel. Plus, the metallurgy would never work. But yet, they were repackaged as nickel projects. Now, I'm going to piss off a lot of people with this comment, but eh, who cares? I see so many uranium projects now with a vanadium credit, yep. and when you actually do a little bit of math that even the people at Sprott could understand. Um, it's, it's amazing how these kids always try and take down folks that are rich, you know? <laughs> I only do it because I love you. Um, He's got subscribers. We've got a balance sheet. But he <laughs> <laughs> I have a positive fund performance. He has a fund. <laughs> No, we have, this year we have very positive fund performance. I'd, I'd do well not to look back to 2017. But. So anyways, I think what has happened with the nickel and cobalt, you'll see a lot of these vanadium, uh, uranium vanadium deposits. So be very careful. But for any of these mining executives out there, I would say go get these streamers and stream that vanadium uh, quickly. Uh, but pure vanadium plays is something very interesting. It, it any South Africans in the room? None. It I doesn't mean, mean that you can't make money on the trade. I mean, I've only been around a decade. Totally, but, but, but as I, long as you I've understand. I've seen graphite, and as, I've seen, yes. you know, me Very, too, me but too. But know what you're too. doing. Oh, sure, and it depends on the promoter and, and you know, how they plan on, on telling their story to the street. But as long as you know that it's a, a, a trend or a, a fad. A trade. Right. Yeah. And doing that, similar with the doing that ladies and, and gentlemen, I mean, the real beauty of newsletters, and I'm not being funny about this, the real beauty of <clears throat> good independent financial journalists 
I remember Bob Bishop being able to do this for years and years and years, understanding the value of a narrative on market psychology, in other words, pointing out trades. Oh. That's something that Sprott's never going to be able to do. And we're Jimmy, basically Jimmy lenders. Dines is the legend. In <clears throat> if we don't see any collateral, we're not going to buy it as shareholders. So we will never be able to help you make trades based on narratives. And both of these guys have, uh, I mean, almost a religious ability to understand the nature of a narrative on a market, which is a very important skill that uh, I don't have. But here, here's an interesting one, though. What about a guy like Paul Matisic, who's done it time and, and time again, and he's now going into the vanadium market in a big way with victory medals? I definitely would go long on that story because of the people. You're going long Matisic. Yeah, exactly. Matisic. It goes back to Lithium X. It might not have been the best asset. It might not have been the best share structure or management team. But look, they sold the company and all the shareholders made money. And, and, and that's a, a tribute to Paul. Definitely. Um, and he's done it, what, six times now? Um, just a legend. Um, now, let's, Rick, let's go back to you know, your favorite sector 11 years ago, the geothermals. And let's talk about the green energy revolution, the realization, the blow up, the build up. And, you know, I have zero investments today in the green energy sector because we sold Altera, which... You and Copper. True, but Good let's point. let's talk direct investment in the green energy. With a rising interest rate environment, which I believe we're going to be getting, how does the green energy sector play out? Um, <clears throat> not publicly, first of all. The time frames involved in alternative energy are too long to suit speculators. And the people who understand how to play the equity game with multilaterals, uh, that is that you get, if you will, politically correct investment that's looking for a sub-economic return, makes it very, very difficult for true free market participants in alternative energy to do well. <clears throat> Similar, similarly to the oil and gas, now that the narrative is out of that game, what you find in the alternative energy space is that if you're going to pursue those projects, you pursue them privately. And I agree with you completely, given that these things, some of these wind farms now are being financed 100% with debt. If you take the interest rate up 200 basis points or 300 basis points, the bank owns it, the wind that house. hurts. I mean, that really, really, really hurts. When I first was into uh, wind farm finance, uh, typically 35% of the capital structure at the construction phase, never mind the workup phase, 35% of the capital structure was equity. And <clears throat> now these things are being financed. Ross financed one before he sold Altera, 100% debt. And that makes it much more interest rate sensitive than you think. I mean, the, your, return on capital, your return on equity is infinite if you put no equity in. But boy, if it turns against you, it's ugly. So... Um People love the narrative and, and the gospel of Rick, but what they want is stock picks. So, Nick, what is your number one energy pick? It could be in any energy commodity. It could even be a copper pick if you think that right. copper's the best, best way to play the changing energy dynamic. I like some really small ones, but that's dangerous on a stage like this. I'm just going to say fission uranium. I own a lot of it. The asset's not going anywhere. I think eventually it's going <laughs> to either get bought out or have to be combined with next gen to get a mill built there. And I think that once you once you finally get the uranium bull market that everyone is expecting, but that has been stubborn to materialize, I think that that's the best undeveloped uranium asset in the world and it will it will fetch significant premiums in the market once money comes back into that sector. Rick? I'm not being cute. I actually don't have a number one pick. I think different horses for different courses. I, <clears throat> I would ask most okay, people. What is your largest investment in the energy sector? Or a derivative within the changing energy dynamic? Largest investment in the energy sector is a legacy position that I've owned for many, 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 many years called Panhandle Royalty. It has paid me enough dividend that I have no net exposure to it anymore. I receive my cash from it. At what price would you start buying it again? Uh, for people that don't have <clears throat> uh, a conventional oil and gas exposure, I'd probably buy it, you know, 25 bucks, I'd, you know, I'd probably buy it in this range. About what, yielding 4% 4 4 right now? Uh, yielding a little better than 4% right now. And <clears throat> for myself, uh, you know, I'm in the drip, the dividend reinvestment plan. So I'm, I guess I am still buying the stock. <laughs> I just don't think of it because I don't feel it except at tax time. 
Excellent. Ladies and gentlemen, Nick Hodge and Rick Rule, thank you guys very much. Thank you, Mary. Thanks.